Hello, everybody. My name is Matt. Thanks for joining us today uh, for this conversation between Jennifer Brody, author of 200, and Jonathan Mayberry, author of a, an entire library worth of books. Um, That's true. <laughs> very happy to have both of them here today to uh, talk about the, the price of immortality, um, which I know will be a, a very fun conversation. Hi, hey, Tiffany. Um, so I'm just here to do the Vanna White section. Um, obviously, the most important thing is to buy those books uh, down with the buy button below. Um, get your signed copies that we have in store. Um, otherwise, we've got the chat to the right, or if you're on your phone, you got the chat below you. Say hi. Uh, you know, join in the conversation. And if you want to ask a question of either Jennifer or Jonathan. Uh, pop that in the ask a question section. Uh, we've already got one, it looks like, already, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are the major things. So the first half of the show will be uh, Jonathan and Jennifer talking to each other. And usually the rest is devoted to audience questions. So make sure you get those in um, when you can. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan. And you guys have a great conversation. I'll see you at the end. Thanks Thank so much. So, Jennifer, um, it's funny, you and I have known each other for, for a while, but we, we have one of those, what, what I call a serial friendships, where we, we meet each other at conventions and just pick up where we left off. And I, I knew you primarily as a young adult writer, but you know clearly you've broken out into other areas and into one of my favorite areas, which is graphic novels. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm, I'm, for those who don't know what uh, 200 is, can you kind of give a, a quick, you know, thumbnail of what that what that book's about without spoilers. Okay, no spoilers. Oh my gosh, it does have a lot of twists and turns. Um, it was originally a short story that I wrote, and that short story opened a lot of doors for me when I was first aspiring to become a writer. I did workshop it at Tin House with Victor Laval. If anyone's familiar with Victor's work, he's a huge mentor, and I'm a huge fan of his writing. I think he's one of the best writers working, both in comics. He's gone into comics heavily too, okay. and um, also novel, of course. And I got a lot of feedback and didn't take any of it and then went on to publish it as was essentially. And then it just always felt like it could be a bigger story. The idea felt very big to me. Um, and I kind of kicked it around. Is it a novel? Is it this? But I had long wanted to work in graphic novel. I'm a huge comic fan. I'm a huge nerd and specifically loved where graphic novel was going, where it was getting more sophisticated, more different sorts of characters, different sorts of stories. And I met this great artist named Jules Rivera at Anacon, same way that you and I met Jonathan in, at an event. And I just loved her sci-fi um, indie comics. She wrote something called Valkyrie Squadron mm -hmm. and kind of approached her about the idea of adapting this to a longer work into a graphic novel. So 200, it really meditates on this question of um, if you could live forever, would you want to? And we've seen this more, I think, explored in vampire stories. But in this case, I wanted it to have um, a science underpinning. So essentially, there's a world where there's a cure for aging and illness. Um, you don't get sick, you're not going to grow old. You're not immortal, you can still get hit by a bus and die, but you're not going to age and you're not going to get sick. And it's like a vaccine, it's administered to everyone, it's egalitarian, it's meant to be a good thing, it's not a dystopian story in that sense, it's not only the rich get it, because I think we've seen that a lot and that didn't interest me. Um, and then basically when people start to turn about 200 years old, that's why it's called 200, they start to lose their stuff mentally. So even though your body is built to handle immortality now, essentially the human mind is not built for it. So the rampages start kind of like the mass killings we see now, but worse. So they study the problem and the solution now is that when you turn 200, you must take a test and that test will determine if you have the mental capacity to handle immortality or you must be euthanized. And the thing is almost nobody passes this test and no one really knows what criteria it takes to pass this test or what it is. Um, so essentially in this world where the story picks up, we know you're gonna get about 200 years um, and you're pretty sure you're not gonna get more than that. Um, but I try to pitch it as, I'm like, that's a good deal. You would take this deal. I would take this deal, right? Like it's not a bad deal. That's better than you get now. You know, if I could um, have a younger body, I would definitely do the deal. Yeah, that's what would happen. You would totally take it, but even not, you just wouldn't get sick and you wouldn't get any older. That's not so terrible, right? No. 
you would take it. So, because there are people who were first wave of care who were older when they got it, and they do say the same at that point. But you had to have been like first generation, like a long time ago. Anyway, so the main story picks up where we we meet a woman named Ava on her 200th birthday. Um, she was married for a long time. Um, anyone who's been married knows ups and downs in a relationship, but it was mostly good. And her husband was six months older. So six months ago, the escorts came and took Owen, her husband, for his tests. Um, and he never came back. So she's just like, screw it all. She's on a bender. She's drinking. She's chain smoking. It can't hurt her anyway. She's like, well, I've already lived long enough. I don't need to live anymore. I know I'm losing my stuff mentally. I'm going to fail this task. Plus, why would I want to keep living if I'm going to be alone? I had enough time. Let's just go do this thing. So the escorts come. They're like, well, who's excited to take this test? No one's ever excited. She's like, I'm so excited. Let's go. And then um, on the way to her testing room, she sees someone who works there who looks like her husband. So then the main question becomes, did Owen pass his test? Is he still alive? What really happened to him? So that becomes what she has to figure out. Fantastic. So would you pass the test? Mm -hmm. I think there's a chance I might. But I, the thing is, like my artist and I do know what it takes to pass the test because we had to understand in order to do the story and develop the back end questions. But the answer is a little bit disturbing about what it might take. Um, okay. What you about will. you, Jonathan? Would you pass? I know you read the book. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a pretty good shot at it, but I'm not entirely sure I want to live beyond 200 years. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's such a challenging thing because you know, I'm in my 60s now, and, and I can. My view of of extended life is also filtered through the fact that you know I do have screws and pins holding different parts of my body together, and lots of scar tissue and arthritis and other things that happen. You know, after a certain amount of time, if all of that could be erased and I could be fit, completely fit again, that that would probably change my thought. But um, I don't know how many people would actually be prepared to live that long. Yeah, I think it's a fun question to think about because I think a knee jerk, a lot of people would be like, yeah, of course I'd want that. But then if you really start to deep dive and think about it as we do with the book, um, you might be like, wait, no, maybe I don't want that. And that's where the idea came from. It actually came from someone saying they wouldn't want to live that much longer. That was where I first got the idea. So I'm being like, just that's it. I've had enough time. I'm old. I don't feel so good. Let's just go. Most of my friends are gone. I was like, oh, that's so interesting, you know? And, and I guess it would also tie into, to, you know, individual religious beliefs, like like if somebody was Buddhist, they might not care about immortality because they do believe in reincarnation, for example. Um, somebody who's um, an atheist who doesn't believe in, in reincarnation or life after death might be might have a lot more draw to it, you know, might, might, might be drawn Well, more. you're starting to hit on who might really want it because, yeah, well, there's also this idea, right, if you've lost people, if you believe in an afterlife, that you could be reunited with them in the afterlife. So mm -hmm. therefore you might want that as well, but the, you're hitting on it closer with the atheist stuff. Like it, you have to basically be, I believe, a, a borderline sociopath slash nihilist slash atheist to really want this. That's kind of what the book meditates on. You have to choose yourself and you have to kind of be in it for yourself. I'm okay with the borderline sociopath thing, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it can correlate with high intelligence. <laughs> now, have you, uh, has this started conversations for you with people about immortality? Yeah, I think especially with the short story and when I first started kicking it around, um, it's just a bit, really big world and universe. And it is supposed to be a trilogy of books. We're just a little bit behind right now due to Jules. She got hired to write Mark Trail, which is um, the cartoon that's in newspapers. She's, um, I think, the second only Latino syndicated uh, column uh, cartoonist in history, which is cool. And she's that's made Mark Trail super haughty and super fun and really kind of brought it up. Um, and then I got, yeah. That comic needed some uh, new life. Yeah, it's been it needed around. freshening. Yeah. She made him look like Don Draper, basically, from Mad Men, like Thirst Trap. And then, um, I mean, the, the great thing about Mark Trail is that it, it has this big environmental theme. So it's still super hyper relevant if you right. modernize, you know, the problems that he deals with. But yeah, no, it needed some freshening. That's definitely why they hired her. And I've been busy with really Mark Trail in like uh, pyramids, you know, cave walls in, in France, you know. Um, so gra graphic novels, you know, we both do graphic novels. We both do novel novels. I, you know, I define myself more as a novelist who does graphic novels. Mm -hmm. What is the different, I mean, what's the process like for you when you do a graphic novel? How is that different from the way you write a novel? 
Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, which is why I'm drawn more to graphic novel than serialized comics, although I would never say that I would never do something like that. Um, serialized storytelling does have a draw to me to a certain level, but it's also why I think I'm more film than TV in a way. I like a longer storytelling. I'm like you, I write really long books when I'm writing my own stuff, and every book I'm like, this one will be shorter, and then I <laughs> fail my own test of writing a shorter book. So I'm with you in the 150,000 word club on my drafts, um, and I know that pain. So I definitely like the idea, and that's part of why I started wanting to get into comics, is this idea that graphic novels are starting to take on a lot more and be published a lot more, and I like that format. For me, it's sort of this middle ground between novel and film, because my background's working in film, and I do write scripts. So a graphic novel script kind of reminds me of a screenplay quite a bit, which you'll know as well, because I know you've worked in many mediums. Um, and I kind of think of working with the artist sort of the way it is when I work with a director on a film. Right. They bring this visual component. They think about frames, like how like shot lists, like how how to make it look. Um, I give my artists a lot of leeway, especially in things like action sequences, like and same on film. Right. It's like I'm not going to sit there and beat out the shots for my director in a script. I'm going to let my director come in and visualize how this action scene is going to block and play out. And for me, it's the same in graphic novel because I do tend to write sci fi. I do tend to have action set pieces. Um, so it's sort of this like lovely middle ground between prose novels. Um, I just have to get used to writing a lot less words and, you know, but I'm still, you know, having a whole arc of story, all the structure beats that go into telling a full story. I still get that deeper kind of dive that you get with the longer page length where you can go deeper into character and deeper in to the concept and themes. So it's sort of this little middle ground, but I will say after writing prose, I'm like, it's so much easier. All I have to do is sketch scene and type dialogue and sound effects, sketch scene. You know, it's like when you're having to do everything in a prose novel, it just takes a lot more words and a lot yeah. more time. Um, it takes, I think it's a different skill set. I'm a very visual writer though. So I think that helps me a lot to be able to import into comics and graphic novels. But I, I find your writing very visual as well, Jonathan. And I think you kind of have a similar um, way that you write and see things. Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, my background, uh, I'm an artist as well as a writer. Yeah. I, not professional level, but enough to, to, that I understand how dramatic beats can work. And I, I did a lot of theater, a um, mm -hmm. lot, a lot of theater over the years. And, uh, it, and I've also- What haven't you done? Uh, math, successfully. <laughs> oh, I'm actually very good at math. Yeah. No, I love your math that you did for Kagan. Oh, well, that actually, I did the er ugly version and gave it to a professional <laughs> map maker who did that version of it. Ooh, that's so cool. Um, but um, in, in one of the things I found when I started doing graphic novels is um, how much control you have to share in, in graphic mm -hmm. novels, which you don't in, in fiction. I mean, we're writing a novel, it's you and your brain, and then it goes to the editor. Whereas in comics, I mean, the, the like stuff I did with Marvel, the editor is very hands-on. The artist had a lot to say because it's a visual medium, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, the first couple times I would write a script, I would I would get notes back from the artist like uh, that's great, but um, perhaps they'd like to see the actual art in all those word balloons. Um, I Jules would tell me the same thing: less words, less words. <laughs> I had to dial it back, um, and uh, and also the, the collaborative process too, because the artist, mm -hmm. I mean, we write the the. Uh, the, the art direction. We tell them what goes in the panels, but we'd be crazy if we didn't listen to them when they came back to us and said, you know, this might work with, you know, and it's, or have, give us thumbnails and we can see a, a different, different way of putting that out there. That's hundred cool. percent. I totally agree. It's hyper collaborative. And if you're, I think I find you to be a very collaborative sort of individual. Not all authors are some are you've all know, we've all known those very precious individuals. I know some of them. Um, I am also hyper collaborative. I mean, just for example, making a film, how many people are involved in any yeah. film project, even a lower budget film is crazy, right? Just watch the credits on a movie. I think it necessitates collaboration, right? It's very rare even that the same writer is also the director of a film. So yes. I like it because I find if you have a good eye for talent and you work with cool people, they elevate your work or they bring neat elements. Okay. And if you're open to that, it makes this cooler, better product in the end. And I think you'd be crazy not to listen, especially, you know, for me coming into this more new to comics, you know, mostly just as a fan, you know, to listen to people who have actually worked in the medium for quite a while. Um, so I'm totally with you. Jules and I collaborate very heavily and we would, as writing, go back and forth, as you said, after the script's done, but with panels and like checking, you know, she would send thumbnails, like, how does this look? You know, and we would go back and forth the whole process of designing the book because the art um, burden is a lot heavier, the workload, than it is for the writer. The artist has to do a lot more. 
Um, yeah, like like if I if I have a uh, in my script say two page spread Manhattan blows up, that takes me two seconds to type. Poor artist has to has to draw that, you know, and but visualize the whole thing. You're so yeah. right. One of the things I found also interesting, and, and they don't get as much love, is uh, colorists. I work with Lee Lockridge mm -hmm. a lot for a lot of my Marvel stuff, and he his approach to doing colors is very cinematic. A lot of uh, single color washes, monochrome washes, mm -hmm. and it gives a cinematic feel. The artist, like in this one particular project I was doing, the artist is Gordon Parlov, who is very uh, primitive in, in art style, and. You know, my I, I tend to gravitate more toward the photorealistic art style. There, you know, like Neil Adams, and Scott Eaton, Ken Lashley, mm -hmm. but he, but he, that artist working with that colorist elevated the whole thing to a very cinematic view, which made me feel like the story was better than what I wrote, and that's know, a wonderful that thing because cool. it's a true team effort. Well, I think that's so cool. Yeah, and the color is a big thing you bring up. Jules, one of her main talents is color. She is known. She has worked as a colorist. Uh, although going forward, again, because we're so busy, we probably we have a colorist we're probably going to hire that she's handpicked um, when we start to go into Spectre Deep Six too. And you're right because um, we've done two books together. Uh, Spectre Deep Six is more of our Ghost Soldier superhero book. Two Hundred is more of our Philip K. Dick style dystopian. And we did different color schemes. Um, Spectre Deep Six is more superhero-y, full color book, um, more colorful, a little more cartoon-like because of that. Um, whereas 200 is much darker, single splash color. The colors have meaning, um, almost more Sin City-esque in that sense yeah. um, mm -hmm. and moodier. Yeah, and so exactly what you're saying is that those tones shift how the story feels. Like Spectre is a little goofier. It's got more jokes in it. It's more fun. It has that more of that bantery comic book tone, whereas 200, is more snarky and a bit darker and dark comedy, which I also love. So it's fun to, it's a nice palate cleanser to go between different types of stories. Yeah, and, and that, uh, the art team uh, allows you to tell more story than than what uh, than what, what appears to be going on uh, because the art is telling part of the story that the dialogue is, is telling a different part of and maybe captions whoever is telling another part of. All of those things conspire to tell a lot deeper story than people realize. It's one of the reasons that people who criticize comics clearly don't read comics. Oh my gosh, you see those tweets, they go off every every so often. And I'm just like, we're, it's the whole novelist saying, hey, graphic novels aren't real novels. And I'm like, you're just insecure and yeah. you're a snob. And you you it's the same, I mean, it used to be like for, I know you've written a lot of children's category. I mean, your Rotten Ruin series is pretty much canon in schools now, which is why I, have you ever gotten people being like, why don't you tell adult stories? Or why are you why are you always writing stories with zombies and like um, robots? Why don't you tell a real story? You know, and I always find that comes from this like trying to be a literary writer insecurity, whereas our stuff tends to be more popular and like kids do love it. I hate this idea that writing for younger readers is somehow not worthy or not on a certain level. I also get yeah. the ones where it's like, I hate adults who read YA in middle grade. I'm like, why? Why would yeah. you be angry about that? I need a button that sends a mild electric shock to people who say things like that. Um, yeah, it happens. I, there was a big thread that went off on Facebook recently with some, I was on HWA, a Hero Writer Association, where some guy was being a jerk and saying, oh, how dare adults read YA fiction thing, you know? Yeah, fight me. Um, yeah, or it's like people, like, adults shouldn't play video games. Yeah. <laughs> It's 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 ridiculous. It's, it's a it's a lack of understanding of the form, you know. Now, speaking of, of uh, uh, Spectre Deep Six, mm. um, you know that's that's kind of exciting because next week is the Bram Stoker Awards, which I am emceeing. I and, didn't know uh, you were emceeing. Oh, MC MG. It'll be online. I may yeah. may or may not wear pants. We'll we'll find out. <laughs> but, uh, that's always the question. I'm actually in a full thing right now, but occasionally I'm like, I'll just put a top on with my sweatpants. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But the Bram Stoker Week Awards are next week. Uh, Spectre Deep Six is up for a Stoker Award. It's your first Stoker nomination, isn't it? Yes, and it's so yeah. exciting. It was because it's the first time we ever did a graphic novel. We're so thrilled. Yeah, we're actually working on our little, if we win, we have to pre-record acceptance videos. So Jules and I are trying to get that done right now. Um, mm. It's yeah. it, I, I keep my fingers crossed. They don't actually tell me who the winners are until the thing, which is, is frustrating because- You're like I the Oscar host. Yeah, and I know everyone who's who's nominated too, which is kind of funny. The Horror Writers Association is a wonderfully inclusive family for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really excited about um, uh, Deep Spectre, uh, Spectre Deep Six. I think it's a it's a great comic. It's so much fun. Um, 
it, it, it like a lot of your stuff, it takes some pretty interesting twists and turns too. Yeah, so I, I find that my stories, I, I think I tell stories a little differently or take things differently than a lot of people. Um, Spectre Deep Six is cool because on the surface, it seems like this is comic book. But if you get deeper into it, there's a lot more going on with it. The comic is almost a fun frame to explore something else. Um, it's a, It's been a fun story. That one's fun to write. And uh, we ha are attaching right now a great directing team. Um, to write and direct. So that's about to got as a big feature pitch. And we're working with CAA and my agency, Gersh. And it's cool. the Dasani brothers who are super talented. And it's going to be kind of a born identity with ghost sort of film pitch. Impressive. But it's always fun when you like pitch something. Because originally I saw this as proposal and I comped it. And I comped it as born identity and left him Nikita meets ghost. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's always fun then to see that kind of come full circle on the comps. But yeah, I think it lends itself to that potentially. Cool. But we're excited about this weekend. And now that I know you're hosting, I'm definitely going to have more fun watching. I'm excited. Sure. There's a lot of great folks up for stuff. And we're just happy that we even got nominated. And Horror Writers has just been such a fun crew. I'm just sad it's not in person because I went to the Stoker Con that was on the Queen Mary and it was such a blast. Do you remember that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the last time I saw you, actually. Yeah, probably. Because, yeah, that would have been, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, wow. But, um, yeah, I, I love I love the, the Stoker Awards. I love the, the, the whole atmosphere of it um one of my stokers was was in fact the graphic novel stoker and uh mm -hmm. i i had i worked with uh, tyler crook and he was one of those artists kind of like like jules with the first book where he did everything that i didn't do so he did uh the art the the lettering the colors the covers everything and one stop shopping which is rare in in comic book world to, to get someone who's it that is talented. jules can do that but you're right that it's rare that you get someone that has that full spectrum of ability yeah. it is rare. and, the, and the, the the award is supposed to be for the writing of it but really it is for the the entire thing because in comics comics without without art is a script you know totally. you need art, so. i so, totally agree with you shifting gears a little bit um you also write under the name of Vera Strange, which is one of my favorite pen names, Vera Strange. I'm I love sure. it. I love being oh, Vera Strange. I love it when people write me, like kids write me fan letters to Vera Strange. It makes me yeah. so happy. <laughs> so, first off, I mean, how did you get that gig and why did you use a pen name rather than Jennifer Brody? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, it started out um, when Disney approached me about the idea of doing a sort of goosebump style middle grade series with Disney villains. and. As you know, I'm a huge fan of the horror genre. I grew up reading Goosebumps and Christopher Pike and R.L. Stein and all that creepy stuff, devoured those as a kid. Um, so they had me audition originally. Um, they were like, which villain do you want? And I was like, uh, Ursula? Come on, guys, <laughs> let's do Ursula. Um, I like villains with personality. And in my opinion, Disney has the greatest villains. If you stack all of their villains from their whole canon together, oh, wow. And so I think I read about two and a half chapters to audition. I'd never written middle grade before, but I love that age range. And I'm pretty sure they auditioned some other people, but they did hire me. Um, they said I wrote great middle grade voice. And that's how it began. It started with a three book contract. Um, and uh, then I think I handed in the second book. We're still a year out of publishing when they extended it to five which was kind of crazy because I I've never seen five books out of the gate like that. And my editor was like, we've never seen this either, but let's do it. Um, so I'm currently in process on book six, which will be out next summer and there'll be a seventh. But um, the pending came out where we were sort of brainstorming on the series and setting the tone of it. And I wanted them to actually be scary. And each book I craft to have unhappily ever after, which I think was very shocking for people after the first and second books, because with Disney brand, everyone thinks it'll work out in the end. Yeah. Everyone thinks they'll be that happily ever after. And I totally take it the entire other way. Like the endings are all dark and terrible. Um, and so we felt like at this age range of like this eight to 12 year olds, there's some that place where they can believe they can believe enough. And we wanted them to get that feeling. Who is this creepy person that wrote these books? Who is crafting these stories that are scaring us? You know, and there is a tradition of this in middle grade fiction, um, like Lemony Snicket, this kind of stuff where it's like, who really wrote this book? Ransom Riggs, all of that, where you get these kind of mysterious authors crafting them. So we thought it'd be fun to do a creepy pen name for the kids, essentially. I mean, I get bio. It's not a secret. I write them. I'm, my name's in the back of the book, this and that. But that was sort of where it came from. And I like the idea of differentiating it from my other work, which yeah. tends to be a little more sci-fi and a little more adult skewing. Um, so that was sort of the original idea. And we went back and forth. I think at some point the name was going to be like WD Strange for Walt Disney. And then we changed it to Vera to be a female name. And as soon as we 
settled on that, we were like, oh my gosh, but there were whole names that we went back and forth on, whole lists of brainstorms. Um, and I have to say, I love being Vera Strange. I love doing events as Vera Strange. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's funny. The, the, have the, you ever used yeah. a pen name, Jonathan? Have you ever done it? Uh, I used a pen name once. Um, I had done, uh, a f I was had a four book deal with a small press back, back in Pennsylvania. And the mm -hmm. first three books were martial arts, nonfiction books. Ah. Mm -hmm. The fourth book, I, I decided I wanted to do something, a nonfiction book on the folklore of supernatural predators, vampires, werewolves, and so on. My publisher freaked and demanded I use the pen name because he thought my martial arts readers would think I'd suddenly gone crazy. And, um, uh, <laughs> So Shane MacDougall became the author. Oh, of Shane I is Scottish. Of, John MacDougall is one of the Scottish clans. My family. Now I want to call you Shane MacDougall. I kind of love that. Well, he's kind of dead because I, 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 what happened is Shane started getting invited to events that Jonathan Mayberry was not getting invited to. So I had this acrimonious relationship with my pen name. So there was a, a, a party at a writer's center uh, in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, uh, one year where you had to come as your favorite dead writer. Hell, <laughs> So you killed Shane? I came as Shane with vampire bite marks all over me. That's hilarious. I love that. So he's gone. I think but, Vera uh, Strange might be immortal. She just might live forever. Yeah, well, <laughs> you don't you don't have the same contentious relationship that uh, with no, her. I'm, uh, I'm very at peace with Vera. Um I, my favorite is Stephen King and the fact that he started using his because he literally is writing too many books and like we can't put all these out under your names. So he's like, fine, I'll have a pen name and you'll put them out under that name. Actually, right. I did that when I was magazine feature writing. When I was writing mm -hmm. for Black Belt Inside Kung Fu, sometimes I'd have four issue, four articles per issue, and they would come on, out under four different names. The editor would just pick a name. I, I you know, <laughs> one, once one article could be my own name. Next, I could have a Japanese name. Whatever, just you know. Um, but in, in terms of fiction, everything I write now is under under you know the Jonathan Mayberry brand. But uh, Vera Strange is such a cool name, and it's funny the the demographic for that. Kind of sounds like it's the you know the Wednesday Adams demographic, mm -hmm. but that's not an aberration. That's an that's a demo, that's a real demographic. There are a lot of kids out there who they may love the Disney World, and the Disney princesses, but they are quite comfortable with a little bit of darkness inside. And, yeah, well, and I think to love, love Disney, you have to love the darkness because there is a lot of that. I mean, because they're. I'm kind of credited right now with taking some of their stories back to the Brothers Grimm roots because that is where, I mean, if you've ever read Brothers Grimm, like how dark and horrible are those stories? As a kid, I was terrified of Hansel and Gretel. Anything Hansel and Gretel scared the crap out of me because I don't know if there's a scarier story in this world than Hansel and Gretel. Um, Sleeping Beauty is another great example, you know. Yeah, Jeez, horrific. It's hor horrific. It's literally like a death curse. It's not a sleeping yeah. curse originally. So, and Maleficent's my favorite. I'm in process writing her right now. But, um, yeah, so I think, you know, to have that, and I think with Disney, they've done such a good job expanding their villains franchise. I'm really um, pretty close to Serena Valentino now, who writes the other villains, the big villains series. Um, and that's been a huge success for Disney. And then you've seen movies like the Maleficent films. I think they're doing another one, really working for them. So I think there is this really huge resurgence and in interest almost in the villains because they have more personality or more fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I know yeah. people love Ariel, but I mean, Ursula is the one with great personality. Yeah. You know, that's who I, as a kid, I was obsessed with Ursula. And like, if we talk about Sleeping Beauty, I'm not sure Prince Philip has any personality. Um, does Sleeping, does Aurora have personality? It's all about Maleficent. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the villains are the ones who are, who are complex and challenged individuals sometimes wronged by the, by the good guys, you know? Well, so. that's how I felt when I wrote Captain Hook. I was like, I really dug in. I was like, I don't think he's the villain. I think Peter Pan's the asshole here. Like oh, he, yeah. you know, yeah. I was like, what happened to his hand? Oh, Peter Pan fed it to a crocodile. <laughs> he's like mad at the kids. They're, they try to blow him up. They're constantly playing pranks. And if you want to insult someone, call them a Peter Pan. Yep. It's not so, Hook. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I got a couple questions from uh, people watching. So I want to hit, hit some of those. They go back to some of what we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Leonardo um, Craster asks, how long does it take you to write a graphic novel? Um, I would say the actual script process. Um, and usually Jules and I kind of go back and forth or get in a room because I like to throw ideas and we throw jokes back and forth. Um, sometimes that involves drinks um, and making ourselves laugh. Um, I would say I can draft a script in about one to two months pretty, pretty easily, maybe four weeks to six weeks, maybe eight, just depending on what else is on my schedule. Um, mm -hmm. And that's partially to leave time because the art will take a lot longer. So basically we're trying to get the script down and get it mostly locked, although my artist always has permission to adjust anything as we're working on the art. 
so that we can kick into that art process. So I, I guess I'm probably considered a fairly fast writer. Um, I think for some people it might take them longer. I don't know, how long does it take you? You're like the world's fastest writer besides um, Stephen King. <laughs> well, it's funny because most, actually all of the comics I've done, all the, all the things that are collected as graphic actually started out as, as uh, individual issues. Mm -hmm. So an, an issue of a comic and you figure a graphic novels usually or collection, the trade collection is going to be about anywhere from four to six issues. Yep. It takes me about two to three days tops to write a, a, a 22 page comic book script. Mm -hmm. And most of that really is the, is the art direction. Because, yep. you know, the, the dialogue is easy for a novelist, but the art direction, you really have to think it through and, and you know, make some. Yeah. Really and it's when you come to a page, it's like, how many panels am I going to break this page into? It, it's everything you're saying. Like, then what does each panel look like? Yeah, I agree. I think that that's the harder part is is just all that stuff. Yeah. So the structural part of comics is 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 quite time consuming. It's another graphic novel question. Uh, for, um would you call writing for a graphic novel to be very minimalistic since fewer words uh, are the better? Or, you know, is that minimalism to you or is it just a different form? I would say um, it is minimalism, but I think that's harder in a way. Like, you know, having less words, it's like, I don't, I don't want to be a poet. Oh my gosh. I feel like they have the hardest job, but I think having to use less words, but having them make a huge impact actually is an art form in and of itself. Um, and it's something I think I'm pretty good at, but uh, it does take a little bit of practice and work, especially when you're used to having a lot more word length and time to say things. I mean, it's the same when you write like a screenplay for a film. I always say screenwriters are the most frustrated people in the world because no one ever reads what they write, right? Like no one ever does. Like, and they're like sitting there like, read my stuff. And who sits around and reads scripts? You just see the movie in the end, but the movie is totally, you know, goes through so many hands and they get rewritten. So, you know, I think it is harder in a way. I prefer novels because I like having more time and control and more um, pages to tell my story. But there are people who are amazing at writing scripts too. So yeah. it just really depends. And, and part of that also is is the yielding of total control. Is it, it, There is a learning curve with that because, mm -hmm. you know, when, when we have pages and pages to be able to write a description of something and suggest mood and tone, you know, th that's, that's how we see it. But an artist, just like a director or even an actor interpreting a line, is going to put their own spin on it and you have to allow them to bring their A game, but it's not all about us. And that, that, that's a challenge when a lot of writers first start doing comics. Totally true. And I think you and I have the personalities where we are, I think, a little more extroverted and interactive and collaborative. But a lot of writers are not like that. And I think it would be very challenging for them. And the control is a big one. Um, I actually prefer collaborating, even if it is just with my Disney editor. I actually think when you work with great people, they make your work better. A great editor makes your work better. And people are like, well, what happens if they give you notes that you don't want to take? I was like, honestly, almost all of my editor's notes are really excellent. And I have almost never, and a great editor, that's how it will be. And they'll see things you didn't see or see where you had things that were kind of buried or latent that should have been pushed forward, you know? So I actually like that because I think in the end, I look better and it makes me better. Sure. But and, and not everyone's like that, I told, yeah. you know? And if there is a disagreement with the editor about something, you can actually get on the phone and talk it out. Usually, mm -hmm. you know, that results in the version of it that is best for the book. Correct. 100%. You can always like, you know, I would say with notes, you're required to take it under consideration. You're not required to do it, but you would need to have a well thought out reason or perhaps a different way to address the underlying issue of the note or that the note is pointing to. Absolutely. Um, now, so we're jump, jumping over to uh, a, a 200. Um, Question is, what scene brought you the most joy to write in 200? Oh my God, the most joy. This book was a real, there's a lot of, there is um, some autobiographical elements from both me and Jules in this book that were a little bit hard to dive back into. So the book kind of brought up a lot of past stuff. Um, both Jules and I are divorced. And I would say that this book meditates a bit on the idea of a long-term marriage and whether or not it should continue. So there are things from Jules's past that are actually drawn into the book specifically that have to do with the love story she had when she was younger and things for me. So I think, I don't know if it brought us joy. I would say we kind of made um, one of the characters look like her ex-husband and gave him a dumb haircut. So I think that made her really happy. <laughs> Cosmic revenge, don't ever date a writer and then break up with them. Don't think we say that whenever Taylor Swift has a new boyfriend, oh, that yeah. you're then gonna get a song written about you, you're gonna wind up in someone's story, right? They always say, be careful dating. Um, 
but that said, I think it was more, gosh, the ending. And I made myself cry writing the ending beats um, because it does have a lot of depth to it, in my opinion. And I think it, it is more in caption, almost like Eva's voiceover. But I think writing that and it was just kind of closing the, the chapter of that story really brought me a lot. Cool. Jules's what? favorite character to do was leather. We call him Leather Daddy, but Virgil, the escort, she loved every time she got bored, she just draws. We called him Leather Daddy. We just draw some Virgil in because she'd be like, I'm bored. I need to draw Virgil. <laughs> I'm tired of writing love stories. Let me draw guns and <laughs> Leather Daddy. <laughs> and okay. then, yeah. Another question If you meet someone new and had to give them a book to help them understand who you are as a person, what would you choose? Doesn't necessarily have to be one of your own books. So what book can you give someone that would help them understand who you are? Gosh, that's a really hard one because um, I think I'm such a combination of a lot of different things. I mean, when I was a young person, the books that really spoke to me and shaped me were absolutely my uncle gave me The Complete Brothers Grimm Fairy Tales. And I read that book cover to cover, scared the heck out of myself, too, while doing so. Um, Madeline Lingle's A Wrinkle in Time was a huge influence on me. Um, Tamora Pierce when I was younger, who I think was super groundbreaking, especially her Alana series. Um, and then honestly, Stephen King and Anne Rice, I was obsessed with the Vampire Chronicles. Um, you know, and there wasn't back then a lot of LG, LGBTQ plus fiction, but the Vampire Chronicles were a huge cult in yeah. the underground gay community. And they were almost like that. They were the thing that was accessible. Um, and I think that was something um, that I really embraced partially for those reasons. Um, and they were very ahead of their time in a lot of interesting ways. So, and then Clive Barker, and he's the one writer and all the writers, and I have known Clive and spent time with Clive, but he's the one who actually scares me more than anything. And it takes a lot to scare me. I cannot read Clive. I have nightmares for days. I think he's a phenomenal writer, phenomenal artist. His children's book, Thief of Always Aberrant, amazing stuff. I'm obsessed with the Hellraiser movies. It's my favorite horror franchise. Um, but his stuff, I don't I can't even tell you why. He just really freaks me out. But I love him and he's a super sweet guy. Like oh, amazingly, he he's a doll. His art is amazing. But of course, there's always that ripped up section in his art shows. I used to go to them all the time. Um, you know, there's a lot of darkness under the beauty. Um, so I guess I've always liked things that have darkness. I think Disney and my editor at one point when I started working on these books. They were just like, Disney was like, we can't imagine anyone else doing these stories except for you. And I was like, I'm trying to think if that's a compliment or not, because you're paying me to scare children, basically. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of love it, too. <laughs> I just say happy nightmares anytime people are like, rooting I'm like, happy nightmares. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah, Midnight Meat Train. Yeah, so Leo wrote, yeah, I love the books of Blood Volumes 1 and 2. I mean, his short oh, yeah. fiction is just so great. And so many of them have been made into films. I'm so curious to see how the new Candyman that uh, Jordan Peele's doing comes out because the original is a, a long favorite of mine. Yeah, and Tony Todd's a buddy of mine. And I, and Huge Tony Todd, Todd fan. I so loved that movie. It was so great. Well, he's so I good as Candyman. Movie. It's hard for me to imagine Candyman without Tony Todd. Like, I didn't like it when they did uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, I didn't like it when they even, I love Mark Hamill, but I didn't like his voicing of Chucky. I think Brad Duras is, the, is Chucky for me, you know. Exactly. Yeah, They're, some people put their indelible stamp on something. And, you know, um, so... A very strange, strange question. Do you have? Do you do anything in particular to get into your alter ego? Is very strange. Do I do anything? Well, um, I always have to have the hair, <laughs> the fun hair. Um, what do I do? Um, well, just in general, I tend to watch a lot. I love scary movies, so I tend to watch a lot of those. Um, you know, when I'm going into a Disney book, a lot of what I'm doing is um, going back and reexamining the original IP, the original film. Um, and it really varies because writing this Disney stuff is kind of wild because, you know, as a kid, you grew up as a huge fan. Um, for example, I'm writing Maleficent now as a kid. That was my favorite Disney movie. I had the VHS. I rewatched Sleeping Beauty 400 million times. Um, so you're kind of dealing with how you thought of it as a, as a kid and trying to channel that energy. And I'm always with these trying to take the energy and the feel of the original, even as I'm contemporizing it and taking it into our time and our world. Um, so I kind of spent a lot of time kind of meditating on the characters. I also like to buy the Funko doll of the character I'm writing. So, um, which is a very inexpensive, but sort of voodoo totem way to kind of be like, this is who I'm going to do. Um, so I have all the characters I've written, which are Cruella, Captain Hook, Maleficent, Ursula, uh, Dr. Facilier, the Shadow Man. Um, 
So I guess that's what I do. But I mean, I kind of approach it like any other project where, as I'm sure you do, where I'm just trying to channel in the story and figure out who's going to populate it. Who are the characters? What's my world build? Um, what are my central themes and preoccupations? And, you know, even like, for example, with Maleficent, I was like, well, why is she so pissed off? Like, what happened to her? You know, why was she mad? She didn't get invited to a party. She's mad because they didn't invite her to a party. That's the core of Maleficent. She shows up. She's like, what? No invite? I have total FOMO. No invite, guys? <laughs> That's what happened in it. Go rewatch Sleeping Beauty. Hades. Hades was fun to break down. Um, he's my favorite. But like the Hercules movie, I was like, this is the horniest Disney movie ever. That movie is basically like Hercules is like, I'm trying to focus and train and feels like pay attention. And then May walks by and sashays and he can't pay attention because he's all horny for May. That's literally her the whole Hercules movie. It's like, yes. don't trust a hot woman because, you know, right? Am I wrong? I love May. She's one of my favorites. She has a reason for doing what she does. However, it's literally him trying to train and getting distracted by a hot girl. No. And um, that's Hercules. And then meanwhile, Hades is like cracking jokes over there and just mad at his brother. It's like some Thor family drama stuff. I, I think my, the Hercules movie is very. Teenage, it's my entire teenage years getting ready for martial arts tournaments. Yeah. Hercules, that's me, you know. Yeah, well, that was. See? Hormones firing while trying to focus. While yeah. trying to train. It's like Cobra Kai. I love that show. Yeah. But like, yeah, I, I think the Hercules movie got overlooked because of Lion King. But I actually like it more than Lion King person. People will probably be mad at me. I love Hercules. But I like Greek mythology, too. And good and good visuals too in it. Gorgeous um, movie. Another question. This is going back to uh, two hundred. Um, did you play around with any other amounts of time for the tests? And would you change the story? Uh, would that change the story in your mind? Yeah. Well, it started out as a short story, and that was the name of the short story as well. So originally, I was like, "Oh, is it one hundred? But I was like, "That's not long enough. People already lived a hundred, so it had to be a length of time that was quite a bit longer than we currently get. I think to have enough impact and change on the world to be significant. But I didn't want it to be so long that we started to lose this idea. So two hundred to me just felt like the right amount of time because even a hundred and fifty. I mean, I know we're not there yet, but it seems feasible within the next 30, 40, 50 years with advances in medical technology that theoretically could that be possible? I think it sure. could, but 200 still falls a ways away, right? And that feels long enough where you have outlived your normal lifespan quite a bit, you know, where people you'd loved and known would have passed, where the world would have changed significantly. Um, even like, do you ever have this where you look at someone who you're like, wow, this person's still alive? They were born in 1923. What? And you think about what it must have been like. I mean, I've been watching some Captain America in 1923. And then to now, like they didn't have like like this stuff, you know, like how much does the world change? Um, so uh, 200 just seemed like the right amount of time. I think if we went to 300, it would start to get too far <laughs> and people would just be offing themselves already. But 200 has that nice, nice ring to it because, you know, there's that old, old thing about, you know, youth is wasted on the young. And, you know, I'm in my 60s. And uh, um, I think about if I had the knowledge and insight now or, or ha had the knowledge and insight that I have now back when I was young and fit, you know, uh, back when I was in my in my 30s and at the top of my game, I would have had a hell of a lot more fun. Um, yeah, I think that too, because I also think, you know, I've always tried to live my life a little bit differently, I think, than a lot of people where I retain my life always always had a certain youthful energy to it. And I, I maintain a certain openness. But I think most people I live in expansion, most people live in scarcity. And I find this thing where there's all this responsibility when you're younger, you know, to have a job to buy a house to get married to have kids, and we could get into, you know, capitalism and this and that but like, you know, and then, you know, when you get a little bit older, you're like, wow, oh, I spent all this time and there's all these things I haven't done that I wanted to do with my life. That's a very common thing um, that we see in the world. A lot of movies meditate on this. Um, but then you're a little bit older and maybe your options aren't as open as they used to be. Um, so it is an interesting idea to think, well, what if at that age you still were young, you still were youthful, you still had everything at your fingertips where mm -hmm. you could go back, you know, and I'm not saying you can't obviously do amazing and fun and wonderful things at those ages. But there is that looking back and saying, wow, you know, you know, I was so serious about certain things at this time or, you know, or a lot of people, I think they feel like at 60 life is over. But really, from a lot of people, it's a new beginning of time. Maybe your kids are grown. Maybe you've um, gotten to a place financially where you're more secure. And then suddenly there's a second life you can have. 
beyond. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's been this crazy time though with like COVID, but then I'm like, well, I mean, the cure in my book would fix that too, right? <laughs> it's the history of aging and illness. Yeah, there's a whole plot line in the book that involves people wearing medical masks and like jewels when she was, because she had to draw it. I had forgotten that was such a big, and we started this book right at the beginning of the pandemic. She was like, how did you foresee that in the future everyone would wear masks? I was like, I don't know. I wrote this story several years ago. I don't know how I knew, but I knew. And she was like, this is so crazy that you have this in the book. I was like, yeah, I know. It was like, and people often look at this stuff, I think now, and they'll be like, you wrote it about this. But I'm like, no, I didn't. I wrote it way before, but you know this, like when the world catches up to you if you're a sci-fi or spec fiction writer a lot of times you'll write things and the world sort of catches up to something you yes, thought of it's been happening quite a bit you know so, well yeah more now speaking of, of books though um if somebody were to walk out of a bookstore um say mysterious galaxy with um your either vera strange or 200 what other books would you recommend they get at the same time uh, from any other writer you know um, like what, what, what's a good companion book for the kid who's reading Vera Strange? What's a good companion book for someone who's reading 200? I mean, I think for two, I mean, the big influence on 200, the short story when I wrote it, it was my love letter to Philip K. Dick. Very straightforward. I love Phil Dick. I think his writing is absolutely amazing. Um, a lot of his stuff has been made into films. If you're familiar with Minority Report, obviously Blade Runner, right? And it has that kind of noirish sci-fi a lot of twists built in, a lot of meditation on identity, right, and technology. Um, so I would have to say, like, I don't know, Android's Dream of Electric Sheep or whatever. I don't know, probably some that's, Phil Dick. That's Thank what you. I was thinking of, right? Yeah. right there. Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. And Thank also, you. which is which is what Blade Runner is based on. I would, yeah. yeah. And William F. Nolan's um, uh, Logan's Run. Yes, Logan's Run is a big influence, and I love that film, and I always am like, remake it, remake it, but I'm like, well, 200, we have a director named Jen McGowan attached, and we're trying to make that into a feature. But yeah, Logan's Run. Logan's Run, I thought, was really wonderful. Novel and movie was fun, if a little cheesy and campy and dated now. The book was, better, and the book better, was way better. Better meditation on age and, and the, the concept of, you know, the value of life lived and so on. Really, yeah, uh, I would say Logan's Run. I would say um, I really like Total Recall. Yep. Um, which yep. is obviously a movie. Um, and then, you know, I can't I can't talk about Disney Chills without saying Goosebumps. I mean, you know, like, especially, I mean, I think that, I mean, kids still read Goosebumps, right? Like, Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, R.L. Stein's a good book. I love R.L. Stein. Yeah. yeah, he's a great guy, too. He's amazing. Oh, gosh, I would die to ever meet R.L. Stein because his stuff, I just read so much of it when I was younger. But yeah, I would say Goosebumps. I would have to just put it if your kid loves that. The other thing I would say you could graduate up towards or read now would be Serena Valentino's villain series and Cold Hearted's about to come out. Um, I think I'm doing an event with Serena for that. But that's um, he, she did the evil uh, stepmom from Cinderella who, wow. Wow, is she a villain, right? <laughs> we were joking. She was like, "It's a good thing we're both nice stepmoms because uh, uh, we just write the evil ones. Like the guys we date are lucky that we're nice. <laughs> we're actually really nice. We're not like that in real life." But uh, yeah, I would say her villain series, if you really want to dig in, is really fun. Um, if you just want to stay in the Disney canon. And I got texted a question, so I'm going to read that one. Oh, first. cool. <laughs> um, it, what are your three desert island books? Must must have. You're in a desert island. Can I count the Lord of the Rings trilogy as one book? Yeah, they actually make a mega volume with it's all in one. That's true. And he wrote them as one. Um, for me, the Harry Potter series, Forever and Always. I know J.K. Rowling's been in a lot of, uh, she just needs to stop tweeting for the love of Twitter. Like her and Trump, let's just get them off Twitter forever. Twitter's yeah. better without them. That's my opinion. Um, I love that series. And I'm like, you are not taking these books from me. I don't need to buy her new books, but I'm keeping Harry Potter. I'm a huge fan. Nothing brings me more joy. Because people sometimes ask, like, what fantasy universe would you want to live in? And I'm like, well, hell no to Game of Thrones, right? That is that a good place for women? Uh, I was like, <laughs> I want to be at Hogwarts. Come on, guys. I don't even want to be in Star Wars. Like, you know, Galactic Empire, you know, Darth Vader. No, I want to hang out at Hogwarts. I want to learn to be a witch. Like, I want to live at Hogwarts. So it's sort of, I call it my happy place. Um, whenever I'm stressed, I'll watch the movies or reread the books. So definitely those. And I'm trying to think what else do I revisit and reread a lot? I don't know what it would be for a third one. I just like so many different books and stories, but if I can bring some Star Wars stuff, that might be good. What nice. about you, Jonathan? What would yours be? Um, it's funny that none of them are long books, but they're they're ones that I read every single year. Uh, mm -hmm. Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. 
The opening Brilliant. paragraph, I think, is the single best opening paragraph for anything. If you ever need to learn how to write horror and suspense, that opening paragraph. Totally. Second, Did you like the TV show Out of Curiosity? Because I loved it, but it's definitely inspired by and yeah. not based on the book. And what you, actually, like the colorist for V Wars for my comics was the art director for that, Jay Fotis. Wow. I thought um, it was phenomenally well done. I love that writer director. But it was more of a sequel than, than an adaptation. Yeah. You know, it's and, not. He, they say that it was just loosely inspired, really. And and the um, and the uh, color remake of it they did some years later is awful. The original mm. movie and the original book, Shirley Jackson, love that one. Uh, holds up really well. Um, also, uh, Dandelion Wine by uh, Ray yeah. Bradbury. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge Brad. Bradbury's a huge influence on me. And you know he was one of my mentors as a kid. So you know, shut up. Yeah, uh, long story about that, but. Yeah. He actually gave me a copy of Something Wicked This Way Comes for Christmas, 1973. I Love would that. die. Dandelion that book's amazing. A Dandelion Wine, I think, is one of the most perfect books about childhood ever written. Agree. And my third choice would probably be um, a Swan Song by Robert McCann. Mm. Um, it's the it, it's the stand with optimism. You know. Stand is not happy. Yeah, yeah notice I didn't fine. mention any Stephen King. I'm like, I love it. It's my favorite. I don't know if I want that on my island where I might die. <laughs> uh, I would have to say, if I could expand my list a little bit, it's my favorite vampire novel of all time. Which but, is? Uh, Salem's Lot by Stephen King. Oh, I know. Well, see, I, I I always take Anne Rice, but I love Salem's Lot too. Anne Rice also, I like I like the uh, cute hot vampires, not the Twilight ones, the Anne Rice ones. <laughs> Yeah, the Rice books are great. Tale of the Body Thieves, one of my all-time favorites of hers, you know. Great book. Um, I love, yeah, her mommy stuff is so fun. Yeah, it is. And my, my third choice, uh, well, actually, those, those are my third choices, uh, three choices. <laughs> You're like, I could go on. That's my problem is you just that's, come look at my bookshelves. It's one of the problems with a writer is, you know, usually when they ask me what my favorite book is, I have to go and I say, well, which category or which Yeah, subject? or what mood or like, what are we, because like for me, I love Hellbound Heart, the Clive Barker novella yeah. that Hellraiser is based on. I think it's a perfect twisted love story and there's nothing, he, he writes very sumptuous prose. I think people oh, yeah. forget how gorgeous his writing is. I say that about Bradbury. I think Bradbury writes some of the best prose. And I feel like a lot of these writers don't get the credit they deserve for the, just the quality. Because, you know, everyone talks about the Cormac McCarthy's and the this and the that, which I'm not saying Toni Morrison, whatever. They totally deserve that. But I would stack Ray Bradbury up there with well, anyone. I think, I think one of the differences in literary fiction, you're expecting the quality of prose. I mean, it's kind of mm -hmm. one of the reasons it draws you to it where Cormac McCarthy really, you know. That, that's yeah, and I love Cormac, so don't get me wrong. But, but yeah. In genre fiction, the story is so compelling. Exactly. That you forget how beautifully it's told. It's that Will Will Rogers line. It's it's a, a beautiful, great story, well told. Yeah. And, and Bradbury, he hits both those notes. Great story, well told. And that that's a. And Stephen King tends to head it all the time as well. And I think really again, does. and an amazing nuts and bolts storyteller. I mean, I teach from Fahrenheit 451 quite a bit, and I'm always pointing out because again, I think it's what you're saying. Like we meditate on that book being so contemporary still because of the concept of it which is, you know, the temperature with book, books burn, like banning of books, this and that, is still hyper relevant. And, and it's such a big idea. But then you forget how gorgeous the writing in it is. And I said that, like I said about Clyde Barker, everyone's just like, oh my God, his stuff is scary, pinhead, this and that. But then if you actually sink down and read his prose, it's gorgeously done. I mean, it's almost poetic, really? you yeah. know? Yeah. And and there are, there are a number of writers who don't get credit for it because of the genre they're in, because the genre itself isn't necessarily associated with, with uh, beautiful languaging, you know, the metaphor and figurative and descriptive language. And yet that is actually how that genre got built. But you're also dazzled by the story itself. Well, yeah, you can go back. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, like, is one of the great novels, you know, and we could talk H.G. Wells, I'm a huge fan, or like nowadays, yeah, there's there's so many. I think Anne Rice writes beautiful stuff. So, oh, yeah. I mean, I think her writing is gorgeous. Um, yeah, we could go on and on. But yeah, I, I feel what you're saying. I just, I'm like, give us the respect. <laughs> and, and just one, one, one little closing note. You mentioned right at the beginning that, that uh, Victor Laval. Oh, and I love Victor. Mm -hmm. So, real quick story about Victor Laval. I know, Matt, we got to wrap here, but. It was at Mysterious Galaxy. I was in there talking to Rob Crowther, who's one of the, one of the book stars, and um, he knows I'm a you know horror horror fan. And he said, "Have you ever read Battle to Black Tom by Victor Laval?" I and love I hadn't that. Heard of Victor at that point, and I said, "No." Gave it to me, read it, fell in love with that book. 
Um, roll I was with him when we when he came up with that idea. That came oh, from. I can tell you where the idea came from. This is when I was at Ten House. It was me. Do you know Marlon James, who wrote Brief History of Something Blah Blah Blah. And before he went into his fantasy books, it was before he became such a lawyer, it was me, Victor, and Marlon, and we'd stay up late hanging out all the time and got along super well. And we were both all talking about how much we love Lovecraft. We're like, we love him, but then we're like, he's so freaking racist and such a jerk. And I think it was Marlon who's like, yeah, someone should go and rewrite one of his stories and take all the racist shit out of it. And we were all like, yeah, someone should do that, this and that. And then cut to, I remember Victor announcing the book and I remember Marlon being like, what? You went and did it, you jerk, what? Mm -hmm. And so it came out of us basically talking about how much we, because if you're writing horror, you are automatically influenced by Lovecraft, you must be, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in different ways, you could be like, but you know, if you go back and reread them, they're kind of terrible in a lot of a lot of them are, yeah. Well, ways. With Victor, I had you know loved that book so much, and then when I became editor of Weird Tales, I, I he was the first person I reached out to. I said, "You bruised everybody pretty badly with a Vow of Black Tom. Come and draw blood for me at Weird Tales." And he I went love it. exactly that. He wrote up from slavery, which is now in development for film. Um, so cool. Well, yeah, he was writing at that time too. He was working on Changeling, and he was about, I think, part through uh, partially through the draft. I had loved. I found him with Devil and Silver, which is also phenomenal. It's like a haunted yeah. mental hot. Oh, that book is so yet. Huh? He, he hasn't put a foot wrong yet. He's great. No, I think his writing, his short fiction, everything. I just and he he. I know I know how he writes and what he writes, but he writes a lot of fairy tales. I mean, Changeling is a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And he writes like a grim fairy tale. I've seen him break down story. Uh, I love him. He's a real nice guy. And his wife's a great writer too, actually. And and this, I'm going to hand it back to Matt to close this out. But th this is one of the reasons I love independent bookstores is you go in and talk to the staff. They know more uh, than just mm -hmm. where the book is shelved. They can talk to you about books. They get to know you as a customer. And they get to recommend really good books. It, my, life, my, my life as a reader, as well as an editor, benefited greatly from the, the uh, references, the, the suggestions I've gotten just walking in and hanging out at Mysterious Galaxy. and uh, Well, Mysterious Galaxy is one of the great stories. And I think especially because, um, you know, Ballad of Black Tom is a novella and there's not always given the same attention to that sort of book. But a great bookseller, like, I need a hard copy of that. I don't own one. <laughs> well, I know a store that can sell you one. I know. So. I should. I need to get one. <laughs> Sadly, we're out of time. That was a fast hour. Uh, I knew this, it would be, Jonathan. You're the besties. Thank you. So are you. And this was fun. And Matt, thanks for hosting us for this. Thanks, this Matt. Love your bookstore. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for um, both of you uh, being here today. We have one last real quick question. Oh, sure. Uh, can you name a grim fairy tale you love, but nobody ever talks about? Yeah, there's um, the one that I love. I was just thinking about it last night. It's I can't remember what it's called. It's, it's the Seven Swans or the Seven Sisters. It's the one where they all get turned into swans. And I used to read that and reread that as a kid. And I don't know that anyone's ever done anything with it. I'm going to like Google the name, but that, that one. And I don't think it's ever been made in anything, but it has to do with these seven sisters that get turned into swans. And for some reason, I, I thought it was so creepy. And, and they always come back to the same like lake every time of year. Um, you know, all their stories have this like very like creepy element to them. Yeah, my favorite, one of my favorites was one, uh, the cat and, cat and mouse in partnership. Really cute little weird tale. And it's it's worth reading sometime. But uh, we, we're, we're out of time, so I can't, can't go too Six much. Six swans. I said it wrong. Six swans, Six swans. <laughs> from 1812. Yeah, okay. So it's the six swans. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. Matt, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, everybody go buy the book. Um, oh, yeah. Buy. Thanks for supporting 200, our crazy little graphic novel. Of course. I mean, it sounds awesome. I love Immortality Stories. It reminds me a little bit of... Uh, Adolfo Bioy Cesaris's uh, The Invention of Morel, which if you have not read that, um, you absolutely should. It is a foundational uh, sci-fi novel. So um, cannot recommend that one enough. Um, anyways, everybody have a great uh, rest of your Saturday and uh, we'll see you very soon. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Jonathan. Enjoy Bye. your weekends. Thanks, Leo, for showing up. Take Bye. care. Everyone.